Welcome back to the Security Simplified series. Cyber attacks often start at a network's internet-facing machines, such as a company's web servers. And sometimes, all an attacker needs to do to compromise an entire network is to gain control of a single internet-connected server. Today, let's talk about a common vulnerability named SSRF and how it helps attackers attack an entire network from a single vulnerable machine. SSR stands for server-side request forgery, and it happens when an attacker can send requests on behalf of a victim server, and this allows attackers to pretend to be that server on that network. Protection mechanisms like firewalls that protect a company's network from the internet are often not present within an internal network. And this means that by pretending to be a trusted server, attackers can often bypass firewall controls and gain access to internal services. Let's take a look at an example. Imagine that there is a web server on the company's network located at public.example.com. Public.example.com hosts a proxy service located at slash proxy that would fetch the web page specified in the URL parameter and display it back to the user. For example, when the user accesses this URL, she will see the homepage of Google. Now let's say that admin.example.com is an internal server hosting an admin panel. To ensure that only employees can access the admin panel, access control was set up so that the panel is not accessible via the internet, but only from a valid internal IP address, such as an employee's workstation. Now, what if the user accesses this URL? The web application would actually display the admin panel back to the user because the request is coming from public.example.com, a trusted machine on the same network. An authorized request that would normally be blocked by firewall controls, like visiting the admin panel from an outside machine, is now allowed. This is because the protection that exists between public-facing web servers and internet machines does not exist between machines on the trusted network or in this case, between public.example.com and admin.example.com. Using this ability to forge requests from the trusted server, the attacker can now conduct all kinds of things on the network. Depending on the permissions given to the vulnerable server, an attacker might be able to read sensitive files, make internal API calls, and access internal services like admin panels and databases. So why do SSRFs happen? SSRFs often occur when a server requires external resources. For example, sometimes an application would need to create a thumbnail from an external image or create a screenshot of a video from another site. This is completely normal and safe. But if the server does not restrict access to the company's internal resources, an attacker can use this functionality to access private machines on the network. And what an attacker can do with the SSR vulnerability depends on the internal services that they can find on the network. But generally, SSR vulnerabilities can be used to scan the network for hosts, port scan internal machines and fingerprint internal services, collect instance metadata, bypass access controls, leak credential data, and even execute code on the internal machines. First, SSRFs can be used to scan the internal network for other machines. This is done by feeding the vulnerable endpoint with a range of internal IP addresses like these and see if the server responds differently for each address. Using the differences in server behavior, the attacker can gather information about the network's structure. For example, let's say that an SSR vulnerability also exists on public.example.com's profile picture upload feature. This feature allows users to fetch an image with a an URL and it does not restrict access to internal machines. So if you send this request to the server, the server responds with this message. You can deduce that this is the address of a valid host on the network. And this host is hosting an Apache web server on an Ubuntu operating system. And when you request this URL instead, the server responds with this message you can deduce that this is not a valid address on the network. SSRFs can also be used to port scan network machines and reveal services running on these machines, like databases, web servers, and file transfer services. 
Services often have default ports that they run on, so open ports are a good indicator of services running on each machine. Knowing about open ports will also help attackers plan further attacks tailored to the services that they have found. Port numbers range from 0 to 65535. So an attacker can provide the vulnerable endpoint with different port numbers and determine if there is a difference between be behavior in between the different ports. So it's the same process as scanning for hosts, but except this time you're switching out port numbers. For example, when you send a request to port 80 on an internal server, the server responds with this message. And when you send a request to port 11 on the same server, the server responds with this message instead. You can deduce that port 80 is, an, is open on the server while port 11 is not. In addition to host scanning and port scanning, SSRFs can also be used to harvest private information if the application is using Amazon EC2. Amazon EC2 is a service from Amazon that allows businesses to run applications in the cloud. It has a service called Instance Metadata, and this enables EC2 instances to access an API that returns data about the instance itself by visiting the address 169.254.169.254. And these API endpoints are accessible by default. So if a company is hosting its infrastructure on Amazon EC2, you can use SSRFs to query various instance metadata about the host using this URL which will reveal information such as API keys, access tokens, and passwords. Now using the information found by scanning the network, identifying services, and pulling instance metadata, the attacker can try to pull off access control bypasses, information leaks, and even remote code execution. Some internal services might only control access based on IP addresses or internal request headers. So it might be possible to bypass access controls to sensitive functionalities just by sending the request from a trusted machine. And if the attacker was able to find credentials using the SSRF, they can then use those credentials to access confidential information. For example, if they were able to find AWS S3 keys, they can go through the company's private S3 buckets and see if they can access those. Finally, SSRFs can sometimes be turned into remote code execution. For example, if the attacker found admin credentials that give them write privileges, they can upload a web shout onto the server. Or if they found an unsecured admin panel, they can utilize any features that allow the execution of scripts to execute arbitrary code. SSRF is a vulnerability that is full of potential danger. Next time, we will discuss how to prevent them. Thank you and bye-bye.